Hi, everyone. Very few of you have read Mad Magazine, but that was one of my favorite comics of Mad Magazine. Anyway, so, so now the bad news is, or the good news, depending on your perspective, is the NSA is not watching you. I doubt there's anyone in this room that the NSA has even taken notice of, um, because none of us are, as far as I know, terrorists um, or international drug cartel members. You never know, though. But someone else may be watching you. Um, and uh, where this comes from is, is so as Amanda said, um, one, of our edit, uh, one of our editors, our associate editors, Tanya uh, Pampalone, she approached me and said, because uh, I'm like their go-to tech guy at the Berlin Guardian, um, I mean for writing about tech rather than just taking care of technology, that's my day job. And um, she said uh, she'd read a couple of articles about people finding out all kinds of things about people, and we've all heard these horror stories, sort of there's like the cyber-stalking stuff, uh, really gross people uh, finding you online and then doing gross things. Um, you know, the identity theft stuff, lots of, uh, especially in, in places like South Africa, lots of ho horror stories about identity theft. I mean, it is a really serious problem. They've made a silly movie about it, but uh, people's lives are, are like ruined. Once you've, once you've uh, had your identity stolen and, and a credit bureau has blacklisted you, uh, you really are going to have a, a very difficult time. It's actually better in some ways here because our credit bureaus are a little bit more incompetent. But in the States, your credit, in the States, for instance, and in, in, the, and in uh, the UK and in lots of parts of Asia, your credit record is like, uh, your, the, you know, the, in American movies, they talk about your permanent record at school. If you, get, if you, get a, if you have a, a couple of strikes, even if they're not your fault, uh, you're going to really have a tough time getting credit, which doesn't sound like a big deal until you realize how much of our lives revolves around credit of some kind or another, um, including house bonds, et cetera, et cetera. So identity theft, big problem. Um, Identity theft can even, I don't know how many of you remember this movie, but it can even get you arrested uh, instead of the real person who, who should be arrested because someone's committed a whole lot of crimes in your name. Um, so scary stuff, right? I mean, there's also, it's interesting that there's like a different paradigm between online and offline still, even though they actually, online is really real life. You still talk about, oh, no, it's the internet, it's not real life. But really, if you think about it, the internet is real life now. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, it's somehow okay to look at people in bikinis uh, on, uh, on Facebook without them knowing, which is a bit weird. Uh, so, but, uh, like, okay, so we've all heard the horror stories, right? But are they just urban legends? Um, you know, can someone really find, like, find out what you bought at the grocery store last Thursday just by going online and looking at your Facebook profile? Assuming, of course, that you aren't tweeting and or Facebooking publicly about what you bought, because then it'll make it very easy. Uh, so, what I did was I put onto my own, uh, my own blog, I put... Uh, this p blog post and tweeted from my very modest uh, Twitter account. Uh, and the man and God didn't even retweet me. Um, they've got like 25 times more followers than me. No, more now. I think it's 35 actually. So, but, so I thought I'd get, you know, like two or three people. Uh, but instead I got uh, 30 people. So people clearly want their privacy to be invaded, or at least, at the very least, um, are, cu are they either curious or arrogant, or a combination of curious and arrogant, like you're not going to find anything about me. So all I got from these people is their full name and their email address. This wasn't friends and family members that would defeat the point. Uh, this wasn't even, the closest uh, degree of separation away from me was two, which doesn't sound like a lot, but in South Africa, if I'm, you know, for a middle class person, that's quite a, d a degree of separation. A lot of people with three degrees, which is actually quite extraordinary. Most people should be at only two, two or three degrees of separation away from me. In other words, friends of friends of friends, uh, or colleagues of colleagues of colleagues. Um, so full name and email address. Never, I'd never met any of these people in real life. That was one of kind of my, you know, my, my a, a, a criteria for this, for this test. Um, and so... Other thing to remember is all these people are forewarned, right? Now they've signed up for the study. I've emailed them back and said, "Do you understand what it means? I agree to the following. I'm not going to share your details uh, publicly, and we'll see how I get around that just now in this presentation, uh, and etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. So they all agreed. Yes, I'm fine. So now they've all gone if they're sensible, and they've tightened up their Facebook, etc. So now all I've got is, the, is these two th pieces of data, and full name includes middle name as well. And so I'm like, uh oh. I need help. Uh, how on earth am I actually going to do this? Because I know it's possible, but how? Handsome fellow comes to the rescue. Dom is a fellow CTO. He works, though, for a, a much more technically uh, focused company, SensePost. It's an American company. They're an information, tech, uh, they're an information security uh, uh, consultancy, and they're very good at what they do. Um, these guys consult with some of the like, biggest corporates in the world about uh, how information is flowing through their organizations. Uh, he's a very, very clever guy. Also a very nice guy. Helps us a lot for free. Um, 
Now, he introduces me to OSINT, or OSINT um, which is uh, short for Open Source Intelligence. Now, the first thing I think of when I hear OSINT for the first time from Dom is, uh, is this lady. Anyone know who this lady is? It's Claire Danes, right? So you may be more familiar with her looking like this. Oh, you can't see the cry face. Oh, <laughs> Claire Danes cry face. Okay, sure. She's in, uh, she's in Homeland, as I'm sure you know. And uh, in Homeland, there, she actually works for SIGINT, Signals Intelligence. In other words, the uh, phone tappers. Um, and she, previously, at the, uh, previously that she works in human, aka espionage, real old-fashioned spying. Now, all of these int things are that's CIA t t uh, terminology. So the moment I see something called OSINT, I think it's the CIA, and it is. It's a, it's a CIA term, right, which should send a chill down your spine. Um, now, the other part of that, uh, that uh, intelligence, so that's the intelligence part. Now we go into the open source part. Now, at first I assumed open source was Ubuntu, PHP, whatever. It's not that at all. Um, open source in this context means overt publicly available sources. In other words, public data. Now, uh, that doesn't just mean what you guys think it means right now. It also means this, the old-fashioned stuff, right? Governments around the world have an enormous amount of data about you. Uh, the data it just happens to be in a very analog format, very difficult to get at. You have to still have to go and do this. Uh, well, at least in South Africa. Um, but obviously, there's now this, which is even more, which is both more and less powerful in its own way. You know, uh, all of this stuff we share. Uh, you know, either publicly or semi-privately or pseudo-privately, because really anything you share on the internet in any sense is not completely private. So just to talk you through how OS, uh, OSINT works, um, it's, it really is just Sudoku, right, but for intelligence. Uh, anyone, any Sudoku fans? Yes, yeah, yeah okay, so this is all going to be like wasted on you. I'll just talk to the people who, who think Sudoku is about math. So, so Sudoku, a lot of people hate it. They think... It's about maths or something, or like, I don't want to do it. Really, it's a very, very simple game. It has nothing to do with maths. It's all about logic. Nine, it's three by three squares. You see the, 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 the little squares inside the big single square? And columns and rows. Every row has the numbers one to nine, and the numbers can't repeat. Every column has the numbers one to nine, and the numbers can't repeat. Every little square has the numbers nine to nine, one to nine, and the numbers can't repeat. Now, that seems... Like for the guys who don't like Sudoku, like, okay, so how does that help me? It's easy. You know that there are two nines there, second from the top and third from the top. So in that block, there can only be one nine. Therefore, it's in that top right-hand corner. Apply that same logic again and continue until you've solved the, the, the puzzle. Sometimes it gets a bit trickier than that, but that's the whole idea. So another way to describe this is informational bootstrapping. I'm sure you might have played these things when you were bored as a kid, like... Um, and they give them away. They give them out at pub quizzes as well. You know, uh, a group of friends are going to to, to dinner, uh, and then they you know they describe they, have, it, they give everyone a name. and They say Judy doesn't like vegetables. John likes burgers, uh, and then they give you these discrete pieces of information that you've got to figure out by the same process who sits, who sits next to who or any of that sort of thing, right? So informational bootstrapping. So um, enough of the theory, right? Okay, so fine. How do, I actually, how do you actually get this right in practice? So look at my target, number one. Dun, dun, dun. So my first target, um, I, all I've got, is, uh, of course, is her, uh, her first, middle, and, and surname and her email address. So I Google her email address. Seems like an obvious thing, but you should try Google your own email address and see where it shows up. You might think it's private. It's probably not. So I find her on LinkedIn very easily, right, um, through her email address, which she publishes, publicizes on LinkedIn. And I find out that she's an uh, IT journalist. Um, so I'm like, okay, awesome. Now I have a picture of her, and I know what she looks like for sure. Let's go and find her on uh, Facebook. Because she's got a relatively common name, but let's see. And she probably doesn't use her middle name on Facebook. No, she doesn't. But this name equals this person. Yes, that's her. That's definitely her. She's dyed her hair since the last time I saw her, but that's her. I obviously can't show her because someone may know her, and that's really quite an invasion of her privacy. So, unfortunately, Facebook, no dice. She's locked it all down. Got a, uh, got a few, she's got a few uh, pictures of her band. Um, I figure out that this, guy, this burly looking guy with a different surname is, in fact, her husband, so they must have been married. So, she's kept her, um, her maiden name, Go, Go Feminism. Uh, and, but they're definitely married, right? I can figure that out. And they're in a band together. I know the band's name, but this is kind of like kid stuff. Who cares? Like, it's, none of that's freaky. So I'm like, 
maybe the first part of her, of her Gmail address, which isn't her, her, uh, her name, it's, it's, a, it's like what it looks like a handle, you know, like a, what, uh, an online persona that she's used over and over again, possibly, right? Because here's the thing with people. We're, we think we're being really clever, but actually we're creatures of habit, and, um, and we're... we're uh, we, we, we have like an effect, we, we created a persona, we want to keep that persona. So what happens is we make this anonymous persona and then we use that anonymous persona over and over again, right? So, and we think we're being really, uh, we leave, you know, we're being really clever by being anonymous, especially in the 90s, this used to happen. So now I've got this first part of email address, I think that might be her handle. And here's her personal blog, right? <laughs> so now I know that she uses that first part of her email address as a handle. And I know that she also, I go to the about page and it says she's an IT journalist. Definitely her, right? So here's her writing about cooking, etc. Now I like use that. I, I dig a bit deeper using that handle and variations on it. And what do I find? I go. I happen to notice that her blog is on a personal um, uh, URL, a personal domain. So she's registered a domain in her name, and it's also her handle. So I go and look it up, and I go like, Oh, hello. You live in Vorna Valley, right? So. So, um, and there's, there's a phone number, et cetera. That's her work number, but I've now got that number, right, if I, want to, if I want to phone her. That's not too freaky, though. Like, a lot of people do this. It's a PO box. I can't really go and find her and, like, kidnap her and stuff, even though I know what she looks like. I know she's in Vorna Valley somewhere, but Vorna Valley's kind of big, and, you know, like, I don't want to hang around Vorna Valley. That's really creepy. So I go and I, I search around a bit, and I find a site that lets you share your running routes with other runners. Now... <laughs> Now, the, notice that the nice thing about this particular running route that I've chosen here is that it's a circular running route, right? It begins at one spot, it runs in a discrete uh, distance, and then it returns to that one spot. What does that tell me logically? That's her house, right? So there is her house with that S is. So I go, there's her house. That's, that's, Google, that's Google satellite view, right? There's her house. And uh, that's... <laughs> So you can see that building there in the, in the distance. The one next to it is her, is her apartment um, with her husband. And she still happens to live there. Some of the other people I tracked down, they'd moved, but you get the idea, right? Now, that was, all, that was, uh, that was three hours, and, um, and that was the first one I did, right? I had no idea what the hell I was doing. That was the first one I ever did, so that took three hours to get that. Uh, target number two. She, an American with an unusual name. Right now, uh, if you are John Smith, you're much safer online. It's simple. Uh, your, your, uh, your SEO is rubbish. Uh, you're never going to be able to find a domain name anywhere. John dash dash hyphen underscore Smith. I mean, it's not going to work. Um, but it, for someone to be able to find you, you have to be the most famous, or at least the 10th most famous John Smith in the world. But this lady happened to have quite an unusual name, even for an American. And uh, so all I did was I paid $20. Um, so here I'm kind of breaking the OSINT uh, idea here. Paid 20 bucks, uh, got her marriage certificate, her parents' address, a record of her arrest from a minor infringement, and a few, uh, quite a few other things as well, right? And that's because the Americans have taken those, uh, those files that I showed you earlier, unlike us, and they've made an industry out of them. The, their private sector has every building record, every marriage, every arrest record is somewhere floating around in some dreadful uh, capitalist server, and they're busy pay, uh, getting people to pay for access to that data for criminal record checks and all that kind of stuff. So they have a whole industry that ro revolves around that. We don't have one yet, but it's a matter of time, right? I just I warn you about that. Okay, but what's really actually scary to me is not all this stuff, me just amateurishly like bumbling around for three hours. It's stuff like this. This is Multigo. It's actually a South African developed product. It's the, the leading OSN product in the world. Multigo does what I just did, uh, showed you, but it does it programmatically. Uh, in English, that means uh, you tell the machine, I'm looking for this person, find me coincidences where this person is probably that person, we present those coincidences to me and say, is this the right person, confirm. Uh, it does everything including face recognition. So it would have done what I was, do, what I was uh, trying to do in 15 or 20 minutes, which is, in fact, exactly what Mr. Handsome here is able to do. He did the same thing for another person that I was able to do over three hours in 25 minutes. So um, some of you might still be thinking, right, so, like, whatever. So, like, you know, I remember one of the guys I spoke to on the radio about this is, well, you can find people's home addresses in the phone book. Uh, and I'm like, well, first of all, who uses the phone book anymore? <laughs> but second of all, like, yes, you're right, you're right. It's, it's true. But the problem with that thinking, right, is that um, 
what this stuff is really used for is social engineering, actually. So this, I, I didn't do the next logical step with this stuff, which is kidnap slash torture or otherwise <laughs> more likely social engineering, right? So um, this is actually hacking. This is the most effective form of hacking in the world. This is hacking that has caught out uh, the MI5, the CIA, NSA themselves have been hacked this way. And what it is is you phone a secretary and you pretend to be someone else. Or you phone, or you drop, drop a memory stick in a, in a parking lot and someone picks it up and takes and sticks it into their computer. What have you just done with the, to those two things? You phone a secretary and say, I'm John from IT. Uh, Fred needs me to reset his password. He's currently in, in the Middle East and he's really frantic. He can't get hold of you. Uh, his BlackBerry isn't working. Now, you know from OSN that he has a BlackBerry, what his first name is, what the name of his secretary is. Those things are pretty easy to find. Once you have those things and you phone the secretary, she or he um, will then say, oh, hell, you are Fred from IT. Oh, I can, give you the other, the, I can give you the password so that you can reset it. She doesn't know about IT or he doesn't know about IT. They don't know enough about this. They trust you. They have a natural inclination to trust you. So... All of this stuff might seem arbitrary until you phone the bank and they say, okay, I need to confirm who you are, Mr. Fairweather. What's your home address? What's your cell phone number? What do banks ask you when they phone you? They ask you, what's your ID number? These are things you can find through OSN. Um, so it's just worth thinking about. So now, so now all you're thinking, now, I'm going to go delete my Facebook account. <laughs> so now the problem with that is that um, it doesn't actually, it, you know, it's not actually going to do anything as such because... Like I said, that, uh, that American that I, that I just bought all of her data, she was pretty good online, right? I found out that she was into CrossFit, um, et cetera, et cetera. I found out that she was divorced, uh, a few other things. But those are things that are, like, weren't too damaging. But because there's an industry around collecting that data and selling it to other people in America, it's much easier to find that stuff out. And that industry is going to come here, right? It's only a matter of time. It might be five or ten years. It might be 20. So if you delete your Facebook account, you're not going to be safe. Um, someone else is also sharing data about you. The other thing to remember is that, right? It's like, oh, I've never been on Facebook in my life. It's like, let me tell you, you're on Facebook. Someone has taken a picture of you. They may not have tagged you, but there you are at that party that you weren't supposed to be at. Um, you know, so just bear that in mind. So that's actually not the solution. Um, the solution is pretty simple, really. It's, it's, it's stuff that a lot of us do, but then we forget about. Um, checking the privacy settings. So just double check, right? So Facebook has been smacked on the hand quite a few times, so they're a little bit better. But some of the other guys, you might not, you know, you, you, we, get so, we get so lulled into a false sense of security that we think, oh, everything's going to be fine. So we, for instance, we take pictures of people's kids and tag them on Instagram with uh, the location. And some kitty fiddler is, is dreadful creature is, is looking at your Instagram saying, that looks like a likely target for me. So just... Publicly tagging your location, think f first. If you're at, like, the waterfront, well, then, you know, or Brightwater Commons, I suppose that's our alternative. Um, uh, although I don't know if you'd want to tag yourself at Brightwater Commons. Then, then fine. But if you're at home, like Amanda, and I do this as well. Like, I'm the, quote, unquote, I'm, I'm like, I, t I tag our house, the house of the, f the fat black cat when I take a picture of the cat. And it's like, stop doing that. Um, so don't price, pr post your private phone number online. So that, uh, the, my first target, I find her husband's private phone number, right, um, in my three hours of bumbling around. And how did I find it? I knew they were musicians. I went and searched around uh, for her email address on Gumtree. I found her email address on Gumtree, but her husband posting something using that email address. I didn't even find it on Gumtree. I found it in the Google cache. Anyone know about Google cache? Right? So Google keeps copies of pages even though they've been deleted. And lo and behold, there was the private phone number with that email address. Now I have the private phone number, email address. My Sudoku game gets a lot easier when I have really critical things like that. Um, so never post your private phone number online anywhere. Don't listen to LinkedIn. It's not ever going to help you. Uh, don't do it. Don't post your home address anywhere. Um, PO Box office addresses are, are more than good enough for people to be able to reach you. Uh, don't share email addresses, usernames, and avatars across profiles. Right, so I can't, uh, you know, if you want, if you do want to be anonymous, I don't really have any interest in b about being anonymous online. I live, I'm an online person, uh, all my reputation is built online, so I don't really do this sort of stuff. Um, but it's, it seems onerous, but you really, if you want to have any kind of alternate lifestyle that you don't want anyone else to know about or you don't want certain people to know about, email addresses, usernames, and avatars need to be different. Otherwise, 
Maltigo will just eat you for breakfast. Um, so, and of course, then this is like the old-fashioned thing. Never put anything on, on the internet ever, even in the most private context that you wouldn't want your grandmother to see. Um, don't, you know, once you squeeze the toothpaste tube, you can't get the, the toothpaste back into that tube. It's done. Um, and that is me. Thank <laughs> you.